The union representing Ontario's education workers are looking for a raise. And we know that the province is going to go into negotiations with uh, the re-elected education minister, Stephen Lecce. Joining us now to talk about this race, specifically for education workers. And we've heard from callers before on this show that education workers make less than $40,000 a year. And one woman called in to share that her and her colleagues as education workers have had to rely on food banks to get by. That is the scenario for education workers. And they're looking for a raise in this economy with inflation, a recession on the brink, and they're looking for an 11.7% raise, 11.7%. Joining us live on The Rush on News Talk 1010 Toronto to talk about this further is Laura Walton, president of CUPE's Ontario School Boards Council of Unions. Hello, Laura. Hi there. How are you? Just great, Laura. Scott Reed here filling in. And I got my first question for you is just a very simple because I'm not sure that everybody necessarily understands. Ontario School Boards Council of Unions, tell us exactly who you represent. You know, like, so what kind of folks are we talking? Are we talking about the custodial staff? Are we talking about the librarians? Are we talking about, because we're not talking about teachers. Is that correct? Yeah, you're not talking about teachers. You're not talking about principals. You're talking about, as you rightly mentioned, custodians, caretakers, trades, maintenance, uh, early childhood educators, EAs, clerical, um, library workers, mental health support, CYWs, uh, IT, it's a, basically if you're not a teacher and you're not in management in a school board, chances are you're represented by QB. Got it. And obviously those people, like I have four kids in the public school system or been through the public school system, you know how valuable those folks are. Um, but you're looking at 11% plus. Uh, I know you probably can't answer this question, but gosh, it seems like such a large number, even in the context of the CPI increases we've seen, the inflation increases we've seen in recent months. Um, is that like, it sure feels like that's got to be a negotiating number, that that's got to be a number that you know you're going to get chiseled down from. H how do you rationalize a number that large? Well, first of all, we never proposed a percentage increase. What we have proposed is a flat rate increase for every worker of $3.25 an hour. Hmm. Um, and the rationale from that came from many different places. Uh, first of all, there's been 10 years of government attacks on our wages, um, which means that our wage settlements in the last 10 years are, have been eroded by 11%. Um, and then you add into that the inflation, and that widens our pay gap by 17%. Um, so what we're looking for is something that will bring people out of poverty and be, allow them to do the work that we are so proud to do, which is providing key supports and services to students, schools, and our community. And this flat rate offer here, how do you think that's going to work with negotiations? Has that, have you used that before, a flat rate? So flat rates are typically, you know, have not been traditionally used, but we're seeing more and more of them um, coming up out. Uh, what a flat rate does is it um, makes the gap between low wage earners and high wage earners smaller. So when you have a percentage increase, and you've probably heard this before, a percentage increase for education workers comes nowhere close to the percentage increase that is seen um, by other workers. When your wage is on average $39,000 a year, a 1% wage increase, like we've seen from this government in the past three years, was literally 30 cents. No question. And I, I recognize the, the real income impacts uh, that we've seen over, you know, 1% or wage freezes and um, we've seen going across the board. And obviously, we, it, we're in a different world suddenly. Uh, it's, yeah. you know, we're back to 1979, 1981, where we're seeing CPI, we're seeing inflation increase significantly, and everyone's feeling that. But I want to ask you two questions, and I'm going to be deliberately provocative. One, yeah. you know what the political environment is better than anyone out there. And, and one of the things that you hear consistently from politicians when they want to bash unions are, oh, look at these public service unions, you know, they get the big, they're looking for everything. They want all the benefits, private sector, all us folks are out here shoveling gravel. We don't get these increases. So do you worry that asking for such a large raise has, the, has political consequences in terms of fueling that argument and fueling that divide and where people start getting resentful? 
Well, it's interesting because private wage increases, private sector wage increases, are actually outpacing public sector wage increases. For instance, we know that Teamsters got 19.5% increase in the first year of one of their collective agreements, which was ratified in March. Uh, the Carpenters Union, 15% in the first year of their contract, ratified in April. Um, you know, these are increases that are happening because the employer is recognizing the value that the workers provide. And it's high time that this government also recognizes the value that the workers in the public sector provide. Uh, folks like myself were on site right away during the pandemic. Our custodians, caretakers, and maintenance um, have been on site in schools since March 2019, 2020, pardon me, they, they were not working from home. They were on front line doing the heavy lifting during the height of the pandemic. Uh, it's time for us to also realize that when we invest in public services, we're investing in our communities and ensuring that these are good jobs that are paying in our communities. Yeah, because we have heard from people, as you say, Laura, uh, some education workers making $39,000 a year, some callers saying that, they know people who have had to rely on food banks to get by. How? What are you hearing from those you represent, and how are people getting by? Hey, listen, I wish the food bank was a, a unique situation. Um, we're hearing more and more about food bank usage. We know that the majority of our workers are securing second and third jobs in order to make ends meet, uh, meaning that, you know, they are subsidizing the work that they love to do in the education system with part-time work elsewhere. Uh, we know that folks are being denied rental applications because of their low wage. We know that folks are being denied mortgage applications because of their low wage. We have heard of people now taking in borders in order to make ends meet. Um, it's, it's pretty dire. One person mentioned to me the other day that it costs her one day of wages to put a tank of gas in her car to allow her to work for three days. So for every three days she works, one of those is free. I, I hear you. But I'm going to be the jerk. I'm going to be the jerk guy on the other side of the negotiation table. And you know what people say. They say, listen, we're trying to get a handle on inflation because it tears through economies and it tears through families, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like a storm. And so one of the ways that you extend inflation is you end up with wage inflation and then it cycles in on one another. And so you're going to hear from a lot of people and I'd like to hear your response. You say, listen, if we start having settlements of 11 percent plus, then that's just going to mean that we'll escalate and extend this. We won't see inflation fall because people will have to keep, you know, prices will increase to keep price, price, uh, pace with wage wage settlements and wage settlements will increase again. And so when you hear, for example, the governor of the Bank of Canada talk about one of his major anxieties and worries about trying to get a handle on inflation, he says wage inflation. What's the response to that? So my response to that is there's actually been multiple studies that have shown that wage increases are not what leads inflation, but rather corporate profits. Um, and, you know, we have seen that time and time again in over the pandemic. What we know is that what it costs our members to buy a loaf of bread right now has gone up. Um, and they need to be able to afford to eat in order to be able to provide the services that are so vital to student success. Our government, your government, they got reelected re by promising to have workers back. And Ford has repeated that over and over again that he's had it done. We're just holding the premier and the MPPs accountable to their word and saying, listen, our students deserve to have the best qualified services in place ready to go in September. And the employers themselves are stating that they cannot recruit or retain workers because of the low wages. Um, I think, you know, there's a little bit of a false prophecy that happens when we rely on the idea of wage increases actually lead inflation. We also know the corporate profits also are a huge impact in inflation and we're not seeing the government doing a whole lot to stop that from happening well we will continue to follow this discussion laura and we'll keep track of the negotiations we wish you all the best laura walton president of qp's ontario school boards council of unions joining us as we discuss education workers looking for enough money to get by let's just put it that way